Welcome to the first in our new Pix Racer series. This is the board we're going to be looking at here. Now this is a Pix Hawk that's been on a diet and it's an awful lot smaller. And what we're going to do in this video is really give an introduction to the board, how it came about, what it is, what all these connectors are around it and its capabilities. And then in future videos, we can actually start plugging things together, putting it on a craft and making it fly. Now, those of you that have been with the channel a while will know that the Pix Hawk is a great flight controller, but it's a little bit big. In some of the early videos that we've done where we've set that up, you can see it's quite large. It's kind of the size of a pack of playing cards. This is a standard size, so it's much, much smaller. Now, the software to support this is coming out now. So if you want to use something like Q Ground Control, that would be a great thing to use right now. And Mission Planner, the support is coming along for it as well. And you can flash this thing with either the Mission Planner or the PX4 firmware, and it'll work the same. Some of the ports will behave slightly differently. But in the series, we'll be using Q Ground Control, and we'll look at that in the next video. So let me put a few of the key stats and facts up here on the right hand side. This is a new board, it's based on the new FMU V4 technology and that's what the newer boards coming out later in the year will all be based upon. So it's an update of the technology that we've already looked at in the Pixhook boards. So the development team have worked really hard to kind of change up everything and make this board and a platform that they can use for future development. Now you'll notice here that it is crammed with connectors and to get that it's got almost all the same functionality as a real size Pix Hawk but a couple of things have had to be sacrificed but the way it flies will actually be exactly the same in terms of GPS functionality, stability, return to home functions and everything else. But they have sacrificed and removed some of the I.O buffering that was happening on the larger boards which were there for safety when you're flying these big craft so the inputs now from things like the remote control receiver is much much faster and with the sampling rates been increased on this to 4k and some other bits and pieces too then it's a much more capable board for also racing as well. So for those of us that have wanted a board that can do GPS as well as fly a little racing quad, then this is an option for us. It has on the back uh, a micro SD card, so you're going to have to pop one of those in before you try and flash it. It's exactly the same as the Pixhawk in that regard. This is used for logging, but also a bit of file storage as well. It doesn't have to be a particularly large card, but you will have to pop one in there before you start flashing stuff. It has a barometer on board, a magnetometer, it has accelerometers, it's using a lot of the later sensors that you might not have come across on some of the other boards, which should give it a better performance. A couple of really cool things that they thought about here when designing this for racing as well as using in smaller autonomous craft is they've also got native FR Sky telemetry support for both D series telemetry and smart port. We'll have a look at that in a sec. And they've also made the arming switch and the buzzer optional as well because most of us that fly smaller quads don't need to press the button to be ready to arm. We arm the board with a stick combination. So they've made that optional too, which is a nice touch. So let's go through the connectors on this thing. First of all, let's do the top. If you kind of line it up with the graphic that I've got, then we have the big processor right in the middle and we'll start at the very top. So this one here is for your remote control in. It has a ground 5 volts, a 3.3 volts and then your RC in. It'll natively support PPM and SBUS and also a satellite receiver as well. It'll all plug directly into here. It doesn't support PWM inputs. So if you've got one of those style receivers, you're going to have to make sure it does SBUS or PPM as well. Next one round here then is for FR Sky Telemetry out. To use it on something like a D-series receiver, you just connect a transmit pin to the telemetry pin on the D4R2 or whatever it is that you're using. If you're using a X-series receiver that uses smart port, then you connect the transmit and receive pin here and then connect that into the smart port input on the X-Series receiver. Very similar to what you do on things like the NASI32, Seriously Pro 3, SP3 Mini, Calibri, and those kind of flight controllers too. 
Then we have this big chunky thing here, which is a little bit weird. There's actually a daughter board that you can get that plugs into here that provides a Wi-Fi connection. So rather than have to use Bluetooth or other things, you can use Wi-Fi to talk to the board. Now, talking to the developers, they've been testing and flying it with Wi-Fi on, even though Wi-Fi is 2.4 gigahertz, which is the same frequency they're using for the radio, they're not seeing any problems with radio reception. They are thinking about potentially having it so when the board arms, you can set it so that the Wi-Fi is disabled for when you're flying, but that's a nice idea. It means that this then, with a the little daughter board that goes over the top, is something you can connect to as a Wi-Fi device and talk to it directly. Then at the bottom, we have our PWM outputs where we're going to plug our traditional ESCs. Um, then we have by the side of it something which is I've not come across before called CAN bus. Now, if you Google CAN bus, you'll see that this is one of the new technologies that's coming along. It's like a digital network for flight controllers. So very soon we're going to start seeing CAN bus electronic speed controllers where you can daisy chain them together and you'll have lightning fast performance, lots of error checking and lots of goodness too. So that CAN bus support is here, ready to support that kind of stuff and peripherals as well when it's ready. Then at the side we have telemetry one, um, that's also uh, UART as well, but by default that's going to be telemetry one on something like Q ground control, and then we have our USB connector where you can plug it into your PC. On the back it's a little bit different, if we keep it the same way round then you have the I2C connector at the top, and the way this is running at the moment it's plugging into uh, a GPS because in this connector you have the transmit and receive for the GPS and you also have the I2C leads as well so the external magnetometer is plugged into here and just like the other boards that we've looked at this one has an external magnetometer up here in the GPS it also has a magnetometer on the board when you're calibrating you need to make sure that these are absolutely lock stepped so that they don't get any conflicting data otherwise you'll find um, the calibration is tricky and we'll look at that in the next video. So that's what the top port does. Be careful with the pinouts. You'll notice on the board that all the pinouts are the same. They're trying to stick to a convention where one side is plus five volts, the other side is ground. Not all of the GPS pinouts are the same. So in the manual that you can download, and we've downloaded the manual here, and it's something that we've got lots of scribbles on. You can see we've been playing with it. It does tell you exactly which pin is which, as well as some great information, which I need to do a shout out. If you're interested in kind of trying to get ahead of the playlist here and get stuck into some of this before we've done the videos, then there's a fantastic site on RC Groups. And a gentleman called Gervais has actually done a brilliant piece of documentation which covers a lot more than comes in the manual for the board. And he talks about everything from how uh, you set it up, how you deal with the configuration, how you plug everything in, how you wire and power up things like the power distribution board as well. It's a great resource. So I'd recommend having a look at this. I'll put a link in the description. Go and have a read through. Because to be fair, I'm also going to be using it as an aid memoir as we're going through the rest of the series too. So a big shout out to Gervais for doing that for the community. That's a great service. If we continue around the board, then we have our SD card that we looked at before. Below the SD card, we have a debug port that in reality we're probably not going to use as flyers. And then we have the connections in the top left-hand corner. This is going to the buzzer and the arm button. And again, these are now optional on the PX4, which is nice. And then we have the cable that goes into the power distribution board. Now the way the power distribution board works is pretty straightforward. You have the two inputs here for the main battery, battery positive and battery negative, and then on one side you have all positive outs, and on the underside you have all negative outs. So from your ESC you bring the positive wire and solder it to the top, and from that ESC you solder the negative wire on the correct 
bonding pad underneath. Now this power management is the bigger one. There's going to be a smaller one that will be out soon which is only like the power management board from the original Pixhawk which is just doing the current and voltage sensing which is what all those extra wires are for. Um, so this is the big one that we'll be using on the build and as you can see it is kind of designed so this stuff is stackable. So you could make a great whopping stack out of this and mount it onto your flight controller. The danger with that, of course, is that this all the electricity that's flying around this power distribution board and power module is going to be right underneath the flight controller, and that potentially is going to feed an awful lot of EMF and radio frequency interference straight into the bottom of the board and that will mean the onboard magnetometer is going to be next to useless. Now you can disable the onboard mag and just use the external one but I wouldn't recommend that. If you're using it in this way I would recommend that you think about mounting it on your craft with the power distribution board by the side or next to the actual flight controller itself. I think if you're going to put it underneath you're going to have to expect that there's going to be some fun with the magnetometer. So hopefully that's an interesting overview for the board. So you know where hopefully to get it from now. If you're interested in getting your hands on one of these things, then go to auav.com. Uh, you can order them from there. That's actually the development guys. And it's just starting to come into free supply now. And also don't forget there's that great link to that page on RC Groups that Gervais wrote up if you want to find out a little bit more about how all the pinouts work and a great more detail compared to the manual that you can print out for this that's also available at auav.com. So thanks for watching, stay with us as we continue with the series and we start to set this little guy up. Thank you for taking the time to watch that video. There are lots of other videos on the channel and they're carefully ordered into playlists. So you may find that there are other videos on this same subject that you can go and watch. So I would recommend going into the playlist area of Painless360 YouTube channel and looking around and seeing what there is. You never know what you might find. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe and happy flying.